And so we're going to start with something called ethics. Um, let me ask you the question, what is an ethic? See, when we address um, sexuality, sex, marriage, sin, things like that, we often tell people our morality. This is right, this is wrong, do this, don't do that. We don't very often share our ethics with people. And so what's the difference? Well, I have a slide that I think Nathan will be very happy with. Next slide. It's a chart. <laughs> uh, morality is uh, customs that govern behavior. It's what I do and don't do. It's kind of how you were raised. Do this, don't do that. It would be what we would say if you asked you know, Christians in this room about sex. It would be our morality would be, you know, don't have sex before marriage, things like that. That's our morality. Our ethics is different. Our ethics is what ought to be how people should behave according to this higher standard. It's this higher standard of what this teaches and why and that it's the image of Christ and his bride. That, that's our ethic. And often we answer the questions with morality. People know our morality. They don't need our morality. They need our ethic, which is Jesus Christ crucified and risen. They need our ethics because everything flows out of that. We're going to see how sex and sexuality and marriage is a picture of that. I want to share a conversation I had uh, with a young man who's homosexual. This is years back, and we meet, and we're talking, and he's like, hey, man, I really want to meet with you. I have some questions. And he had been to the church a few times. And um, so on our second or third lunch, um, he's like, man, I, I think you're going to tell me the truth, and you're not going to judge me, so can I ask you some questions? I was like, yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm here for. I love you, right? And so he's like, hey, um, you know, why is it that we are using this 2,000-year-old book to say you can't be homosexual? I don't understand like why I'm having to submit to this. And I said, man, that's a great question. I said, what do you think we should submit to? Like, w what would be right? He goes, well, I think we could just take all of the stuff in the Bible about Jesus and Christianity and leave sex to be defined by the culture. And I said, okay, so your sexual ethic would be to define sex and what's right and wrong in sex by the standards of culture. And he said, yes, that's, that's what I believe. And I said, that's cool. Let's discover that. Let's go down that path a little bit. Let's ask questions. Which culture would you like to define that by? And he says, well, I think our culture. I said, really, you agree with the, the, the ethics sexually of our culture? And he started to think about it for a while. He said, no, I guess I don't. There's a lot I don't like about it. I was like, really? He goes, yeah, I hate the way that, you know, it's just flippant and we hurt people and we don't care about those things. Like, it's not pure. Our, our sexual ethics as a culture are not pure. And he came to that conclusion on his own. And I said, okay, well, maybe in other society then, how, what, what ethics should we have? How should we, how should we figure this out if it's not you know, this 2,000-year-old Bible? What should, we, what should we do? And he goes, well, maybe in other culture. And I said, that's a good idea. Maybe in other culture. What about um, a culture that has, you know, that's totally different with us than us? What about Islam? You know? What about a, a Middle Eastern culture? And he's like, after we went through, through that, he's like, no. So not our culture, not a Middle Eastern culture. Remember, ethics, you need something beyond yourself. This, this, this grand idea of truth, you know, this esoteric idea of truth, this philosophy beyond yourself. And he said, on his own, he said, I guess we need something pure. I guess we need something holy. I guess we need something like without sin that doesn't hurt people and things like that to get our sexual ethics from. And he goes, like, maybe God. And I was like, that's exactly our starting point. Can I teach you that? because it's the gospel. Let me teach you the sexual ethics of the Bible. And so then we were ready to go, right? But God had prepared him. I wasn't arguing morality with him. He was completely prepared. Like the Holy Spirit had done the work. I just asked the questions and loved the guy. So I just want to encourage you as we get into this, um, ask questions, love people. Um, if you're offended today, that's fine. Discover it for yourself. If you disagree with me, that's great. Discover it for yourself and then ask yourself the question, what's a better ethic? Is there one? I don't think there is. I think um, the, the ethics of sex and love and marriage in the Bible are the most pure and holy. It's, it's, it's God himself. It's the image of God himself. And we'll get into that. Okay. Everybody tracking? 
All right, so first we're going to talk about two sexual ethics, and then we're going to talk about ethics, loving as a husband, what that's supposed to look like, and then as a wife, what that's supposed to look like, and then we'll answer some more questions at the end. Everybody with me? Anybody afraid? Raise your hand if you're a little bit afraid. Okay, <laughs> me too. Okay. Uh, okay, so for the first two sexual ethics, I'm just going to hit two. There's so many we could talk about, but I, I want to hit the two main ones. I feel like the two main ones, what Jesus uses when he talks about sexual ethics and the very first sexual ethics we get in the Bible, um, number one is God designed sex. That's the first thing you need to know. It, God made it. So again, if you want to ask questions, you can, you can ask those. Those QR codes will be up there. Um, so number one, God designed sex. Why don't we ever talk about it? He designed it. He made it. Like, he inv- it wasn't an afterthought, actually. It was like one of the main things he designed. Look at, look at this Bible verse. Genesis 2.24. Again, it's in Matthew. We'll get in there in a bit. Mark and Ephesians will be there near the end. So for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to. Um, that word joined to is like, it's, it's a cool word in the Hebrew. It's like cling to. It's like you're on the side of a mountain and you're hanging on for dear life. You're clinging to her. It's beautiful. Joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. We get a little bit churchy with that one flesh thing in Hebrew. Guess what it means? What's the one flesh mean in Hebrew? What do you think? Sex. It's about the two bodies becoming one. Okay, this is a verse that's a sexual ethic. Now, I want you to focus on the for this reason piece. For what reason? Well, in Genesis 2, God just made Eve. Because he's the designer. Because I made it this way. I made you man. I made you woman. I said be fruitful and multiply. For this reason, a man shall be united to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. That's about sex. Isn't that beautiful? Because God designed it. Because he made it. Because he wants you to do that. In fact, the Bible is very positive in the way it speaks about sex overall. In fact, there's a whole book just about intoxicating romance. Do you know that as you age, you're supposed to fall more in love sexually? The world tells you that's not the case. The Bible, it's the opposite. Proverbs fifteen nineteen. This is about your wife. She would be a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Does that sound like lame, boring, sexual life? No. One of the biggest problems with the church is like, Kids think that they got to go find that outside the church, you know, because we're not showing them that our marriages are like intoxicating physical love that God designed this. God made this right. The Bible doesn't leave room for us not to say that. And here's one of my personal favorites, because it's what I told my marriage counselor. That's not why we're talking about it. But first Corinthians seven, nine, I just want you to see how different. God is with sexuality in the world. It says, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So we dated for three months. Jessica says four. I say three. I went to the marriage counselor, our pastor. We did it right, y'all. We did it right. I went to the pastor and I was kind of, I was going overseas and stuff. And I went to the pastor and he's like, I don't know if this is smart. I don't know if this is wise. And he's, he's Pentecostal, right? So he's like, I don't know, well, assembly, vineyard, so kind of Pentecostal. He's like, I don't know if we could do this. And I was like, hey, uh, pastor, I need to turn to 1 Corinthians 7, 9. And he's like, man, you Baptists really know your Bible. I was like, yes, sir. Yes, sir, we do. Here's the point of this. This is completely opposite of the wisdom of the world, even in the wisdom in the church. The wisdom in the world says test drive the car before you buy, doesn't it? The wisdom of the world would never say this about sex. But God equates sex with this lifelong marriage, with this fully given over to somebody, body, heart, mind, soul, future, finances, everything. Like That's how he uses sex here, because he's saying, no, 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 get married first. These things go together, right? He's the designer. That's how he designed it. It's like this vehicle right here. Sex is a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. Just think about it. If I want to sell this lame black music stand, 
How do I sell it? Sex. It's powerful. I have this little stopwatch, and I'm going to go way over today because I haven't even started yet. You fill it with sex. It's so powerful. Here's the deal. God made it that way. He made it powerful. He made it to help unite us and bring us together. But it is like this high-precision vehicle. See, would I take this on an icy mountain road? I would certainly die. If I breathe on that gas pedal, that back end hits the ground and that center of gravity and it's, it'd take me right off the mountain. It's not how it was designed. But if I take it on a track and I talk to some people who know how to drive it and they give me a class, woo! It's awesome. Sex is designed by God. Well, how is it designed? Sex was designed for one man and one woman for life. For one man and one woman for life. Let's go to the same verse. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So that's what that is in Genesis. But it's also in Matthew 19. Um, let me get there. I want to show you something. So this is when Jesus says it. So it's in Genesis. God says that's the design. And then Jesus talks about it as well. So uh, in verse 3, the Pharisees come to him and testing him. They said, is it lawful for uh, to divorce one's wife without any, or excuse me, for, for any cause? Now, a lot of people believe that the Jewish culture held marriage to this high standard. That's not true. The Jewish culture Jesus comes into. The Jewish culture that Jesus ends up coming to, into is extremely flippant with divorce. And basically, if you're a man, you can do whatever you want. That's the culture. Sorry. That's the way it was. And so they're trying to trap him because they know that the, that the law says otherwise. And they also know the crowd is going to be very upset with Jesus if he goes against what's the cultural norm. So Jesus answers, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Therefore, because he made them male and female, because he designed them, right? A man shall leave his father and mother and cling to or hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer one flesh, or excuse me, two, but one flesh. Uh, what therefore God has joined, let no man separate. Uh, and then they said to him, why did Moses command you to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? So why would Moses allow for it, is what they say. And here's what I want you to key in on here. He said, because your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. Here's the thing, verse 8, the second half. From the beginning, it was not so. From the beginning, it was not so. The original intent, the original design, the holy, pure, supreme ethic is one man, one woman, united for life together, always just the two of you. From the beginning, that's what it was. There's allowances, but those aren't the ethics. Am I making sense? Sex was designed for one man, one woman, for life. It's like this high precision vehicle in that way. Listen to me, young people. I was a sexual sinner. I was saved in the red light district in Nuremberg, Germany. And so everything that would, you think would go along with that went along with that. Okay, it's shameful. I'm sorry. The world is lying to you like it lied to me. The world is telling you that this new adventure with this new person is great sex. It's telling you that multiple sex partners is great sex. It's telling you, you know, pushing this boundary and this boundary and this boundary within LGBT community stuff, that that's great sex. But that's like driving this car off the mountain. Go read the statistics for like the trans community. It's 19 times higher than for the suicide rate. Go read the statistics of the abuse and all kinds of other things within just relationships where you live together, like having sex and you're not married. Re read that stuff. The Bible's true, but you can prove it. it. That's not the best way to do it. That just leads to death. I'm telling you the best way to do it, and I'm just going to speak physically here because I'm talking about sex right now. We're going to get into marriage and love. Just from like a physical standpoint, that's completely a lie. I was lied to. I was led to death. It was terrible. It's awkward. It's weird. You force yourself to do it until you feel shameful and you think that that's the only thing you can do. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's terrible physically. It's It's, it's bad. But within um, the design, it's so beautiful. It's so amazing. 10, 15 years in, you know each other. 
you know that you know that you know each other. You know that person's body. And it's beautiful. And it's pure. And it's holy. And it's way better. It's the best. It's how it's designed. That's what the design for the act of sex is. Okay, moving on. Woo! <laughs> you thought that was bad. Okay, three ethics for husbands. This is how husbands, how you're called to love. Now, we separate sex and marriage because our culture does it, right? We separate sex in this lifelong pursuit of love. The Bible doesn't really do that, but we're doing it for the sake of this sermon, okay? Cause, yeah, I want you to know they're different, but they're meant to be practiced together. Okay, three ethics for husbands. Now, listen to me, men. I'm going to speak to men, and Jessica's going to get up and speak to women. I'm going to speak to men. I'm a little bit more forceful than normal when I speak to men. I want you to know something, young men. You should not desire to be married because it changes your relationship with God. You go from being a son to a son-in-law. That door that was always open, that you could knock on any time, there's a caveat now between you and God. Married men, if you do not feel God, if you are far from God, if you do not hear and understand God, the question isn't what's going on with you and God, it's what's going on with you and your wife. That's what the scripture says. 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, in the same way, treat your wives with consideration. That's a high bar, isn't it? Just be considerate of her as a delicate vessel. Isn't it great the things that are so beautiful, they're also delicate. That's how God set it up. And with honor... Treat her with honor as a fellow heir, as a co-heir in Christ, really. We have the gracious gift of life, so that what? Your prayers will not be hindered. I thought, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. No, no. When you're married, if you mistreat your wife, this is New Testament, this is Peter, your prayers, your communication with your father will be hindered. This is why I say you go from son to son-in-law. Because now, sons, men, when you go to your father and you say, Lord, I need, Lord, I can't feel you. He's going to say one question first. How are you treating my daughter? And that's how you should view your marriage. That's what the, people think the Bible degrades women. It lifts you up so high. It lifts you up, women. And it calls men into leading well. We haven't even started yet, but that's what it is. I want you to take it very seriously. Number one, you are a servant leader. You are a servant leader, men. So Paul uses this apologetic at the end of Ephesians 5, so we're going to go to Ephesians 5 and give you three ethics for husbands of how to love. Number one, you are a servant leader. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. There is really no other way to take this than leader. Men, could you repeat after me? I am the leader. You sound kind of convinced. You are the leader. You're the leader, man. That's a good thing. And then you find out the standards of your leadership, and it's pretty scary. How am I the leader? See, leadership means a lot of things. We think in culture that leadership means authority. As a follower, this is to women, and we're going to get to that. As a follower, it's important to understand authority. As a leader, authority is almost the last thing on your mind. I'll give you an example. I am the lead pastor. Do I have special authority in this church? Yes or no? No. The board of elders has the authority within this church. What's it mean, lead pastor? They have called me out to be the servant, to be responsible be a servant. That's what it means. That's what it means. That's what it's about. It's not about authority. Leading is not about authority. It's about service. Jesus comes and he flips this all on his head in the whole ancient world. And he says leadership is about service. Listen to this. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Your leadership is about service. We love to say I'm the leader. But then when it says give yourself up for her, it's like, wait a second. See, that's what we're called to do. We're called to worry about our part. We're called to serve. Now, how did Jesus do this? Well, in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus is in the throne room of heaven. And it says he became a slave. He became a slave. He became like a servant so that he could give us the gospel. 
so that he could come die on a cross. That's what this is talking about. We become like Jesus in that way. We get to serve like Jesus. We serve her the way that Jesus did with us. Listen, this is, all, this is built within women to follow. It's built. Think of every romantic movie you've ever seen. There's a knight in shining har- armor, and he gives it all up. I would die for you. Walk the wire for you. Yeah, I'd die for you. You guys seen Robin Hood with Kevin Costner? It's the best one. That, she's called to follow that sort of leadership. Yes, you're an authority, but your focus is service. Your focus is service. Next. Use your words to encourage. Use your words to encourage her. Um, number two. Use your words to encourage. This is extremely important. Ephesians 5, 25 through 26. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. So what Paul's doing is saying your leadership should be like Jesus loving the church. And then he's going to tell you everything Jesus has done. Um, you can go other places in the Bible to see this, but I love the way it's put here. As Christ loved the church, he gave himself up for her. We talked about that. Uh, that he might sanctify her. Uh, having cleansed her by the washing of water in the word. Um, the washing of water is salvation. The word is the Bible. So Jesus came to uh, give us the truth of God, to lift us up, to edify us, to build us up with words of life, with salvation, with his words. This is about saving with your words. And for us, that's really difficult sometimes, isn't it? Because as men, I'm not wired that way. I'm doing this, uh, this running on team Matt Bowman and we are doing we are you know I'm, I'm running all the time I'm putting these these like little uh, uh I'm running slow okay like 13 minute miles I'm a big guy and I put these videos on YouTube well I hear them in my ears I don't watch them and they yell at me and it's like you're a quitter you're you need to be a soldier you need to go further in life in it and I love that because I'm a man right if I want to get better at something it's like I give you a sword and I have a sword and I want to learn how to sword fight. And so we fight each other over and over and over again and we both fall and we both fail and we both get back up because I'm a man, I'm wired that way. That is not how women are wired. They're wired to be encouraged by your words, not cut down by your words. You are a rhinoceros and she is a butterfly. You need to understand that that's the way, that's the way that it's, that's how she's built up. So never raise your voice. Never cut her down. Watch your sarcasm. Never be condescending. Don't abuse her with your words. Use your words to build her up. Period. That is what Jesus has done with you. He's brought these words of life and salvation. That's what we are called to do. That is our leadership, men. Lastly, love her as a radiant beauty. Some of you wives are like, you're going like this right now? Just wait, your turn's coming. I know the clock says 10.51, but we're going long. All right, Ephesians 5.27. Love her as a radiant beauty, so that he might present her to himself. This is what Jesus does. So that he might present her to himself, the church. Jesus does that. He presents us to himself in splendor. Ooh, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Remember, before this, Paul says... All this stuff Jesus does as Jesus leads, and then this is how he leads the church, we are going to lead. And then at the end he says, you know, it's like loving yourself, really. I mean, she's your wife. And so we're supposed to love her as a radiant beauty. Now, I love to highlight, you know, like the little pieces of the verse and kind of pull out the thing I'm talking about. But in this verse, I couldn't even do it because it's the entire thing. So that he might present her to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle. How do you like that, ladies? You don't even get old. Let's say you buy all this cream and stuff. You just have your husband read the Bible. Okay. Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Listen, seriously, I want to tell you something. When you think sometimes, and because I, I think it too and I struggle with it, I think when God sees me, he sees all my failure yesterday and when I yelled at somebody and when I had a bad attitude and all my sin and all the things I'm struggling with and all the things that are going on. Like I think that that's what God sees when he sees me, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that you are robed in the blood of Christ. You are a radiant beauty. He sees you like a white, glowing, radiant virgin bride. All your sin is 
covered by the gospel. That's the power of it, right? And this is saying that you take that reality into your marriage as a husband. My perception of my wife, I choose that. I choose to see her as a radiant beauty. I choose not to see... Here's the thing, guys. That conversation, oh, my old lady, she's nagging me. You think that's a small thing. It's massive. It's against the design. And it starts this way, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And, bigger. and it's a choice. I see her as a radiant beauty. I see her as a spotless bride. I don't hold anything against her. kind of sounds like Corinthians 13, huh? I don't hold anything against her. That's my decision. Period. We have to watch our perception of one another. Here's the problem. We let the world creep in. We start comparing her to every other girl. We start comparing ourselves to other people. We hold yesterday against her and all this other stuff. And, it, and, and then no, we no longer treat her that way. And she's, she's made. She's made. She's built to be loved this way. He, she was designed this way. And so we need to take care of our own perception. Don't give the enemy an inch. And when you do, say, I'm sorry. I repent, Lord. Teach me how to love. Teach me how to be Jesus in my marriage, because that's the bar. That's the bar in Ephesians 5, guys. I wish it was lower. I honestly wish I could preach you, you a different sermon, because this is like impossible. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, and through forgiveness, through the blood of the Lamb and all that, you can, you can live in these realities. Uh, next, Jessica is going to come up and present some ethics for wives. Um, listen, uh, the Bible talks about men teaching men, talks about women teaching women, and she's going to come up and speak to women. I think, for me, it's very important. Um, there are some things that I think are wrong for me to teach. I think it's wrong for me to step into your marriage and speak to the heart of your wife about you. I think that's your job as a husband and other women's job. So Jessica's going to come up and speak to women and give us some ethics for wives. All right, good morning. <laughs> So first of all, I just want to say that Chris, Chris does these things so well that he's preaching about. And uh, I mean, that is the most powerful kind of leadership that there could be. And it is very humbling. It's convicting. Um, it's been healing and changing in my life. And I can tell you that it makes me strive to be more like Jesus and to submit more than anything else could for this stubborn sinner that is me. So... Um, I know a lot of people think this comes easily to me. It does not. <laughs> so, um, what are the ethics of love for women? Submit and respect. And I think in our culture that we really react to this first, right? I mean, it feels wrong. Am I right? It feels devaluing. We've all seen abuses of this. Um, everything in us and around us hates this word. Um, but I want to ask you guys to lay aside all of this for a few minutes. Lay aside all your feelings about these words. And um, we're looking at the biblical roles of men and women in marriage. And we're looking at the design, the blueprint per se, from the designer who knows how all this is supposed to work and who loves us, who made this to be good. And so... I think that while it's hard for us to grasp, and sometimes we don't really want to grasp it, that we should challenge ourselves to, as Romans 12:2 says, not be conformed to this world, to, but to be transformed by the renewal of our minds, that by testing we may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And so I like to think about this like this. Do I have any I, uh, app, Apple computer people here? Uh, iPhone, iMac, I, 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 you know, nobody? All right. <laughs> if you are, you know what I'm talking about. It's the best, it's the easiest, it makes the most sense, just ask us. Um, <laughs> however, if you give someone that's not used to Mac computers a simple task, it's going to be super frustrating. Right, Chris? I converted them. <laughs> but... It, it doesn't make any sense. It's different from what you're used to. And 
We don't like it until you get to know the system, and then there's no going back for you either. Sorry, Windows fans. <laughs> anyway, I think a lot of these things in the Bible that rub us wrong are a lot like this. Um, we have to be renewed, and our minds have to be changed, and as God renews or changes our, mi our minds, and we discover His truth, His design, these things will become inseparable from our lives as Christians, and we'll discover that they're far better than anything else. So let's get into it. Uh, Ephesians 5:22 through 24 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, submit is a Greek term that is a military term that means to place under and to come under authority. Now, I think we all get that. I think we all kind of understand what that word means, right? I think it's more the actual application of this. But I think that we do miss something in, when we look at it like this. So, Submission and respect are how God wired men to feel loved. So how many of you have read the Five Love Languages book? Uh, I mean, we're all always seeking for ways to find, to like make our spouses feel more loved, to connect with them, all these things, right? Well, this is like the OG Five Love Languages from God. He's giving us insight into men here. So two important notes I want to make real quick are, is to submit does not take away from value, competency, or equality in any way, nor does it mean that you don't have any ideas or input. However, equal does not mean the same, and we're given different instructions and roles here in marriage. Um, I love the way that Lori McDaniel defines submission. She, she says, it's an honorable posture of the heart that submits to Christ. And I think this shifts it a little bit, right? Um, we're told in Ephesians 5.33 that a wife must respect her husband. And respect is defined as placing a great value or a high price on something. Guys, God is revealing like the ultimate hack here, a peek into his perfect design for the beautiful mystery of marriage and intimacy. Something the world is seeking and, and you know, everyone around us wants this. And he's asking us women to choose to lay down our rights and to place ourselves under our husband's authority and protection. Not out of duty, but out of love for Jesus Christ. So ultimately, this has to be by the Lord's leading, by, by his power and his strength. Not for control or a certain outcome, but out of service as we, the church, also submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And really what this comes down to is having the attitude and posture of our hearts towards our husbands in the same way that we would want them to be towards Jesus. And this is a high bar, but it, it's honoring, it's looking up to, seeking leadership, soft, rece receptive, leadable, agreeable, kind, and so on. And, and guys, this is just to us here. This is our part. It's not if you think all his ideas are the greatest. It's not if, if you, know, you think he's the most qualified. It's not if he's leading the way that we think he does that we submit. Remember, he's called to lift us up as pure and blameless, even though we're not. It's like I tell my kids, you worry about you. <laughs> but I know there's a lot of you in different difficult situations, difficult marriages. I know there's a lot of heartache in these areas. I've been there. I just want to encourage you, if you're there, to keep going. Keep doing this for Jesus. You will grow closer to him. The intimacy and the comfort that he gives is the only one that can truly satisfy. And there is great power and influence in what you are doing. Jesus will lead you and he will give you wisdom. However, this is not a green light for abuse. So what does this actually look, look like practically? I think it's really the little things. First of all, it flows out of what's going on between us and the Lord, our relationship with him and how we're submitting to him. Then I think it's paying attention 
to and being ready to shift our hearts and attitudes to being self-sacrificing and lifting him up. Remembering he is the leader and we are his leather, lover, not his mother. <laughs> and then I think that it's not being set on our own way. It's paying attention to where we allow our thoughts to dwell. Don't dwell on the socks that he left on the floor or the toilet seat. Don't dwell on the things that might bother you in the moment. Choose to think on good things, honoring things. Don't allow thoughts that tear him down. Be careful with your words to each other and to others. Refuse to talk badly about him. Be careful with your sarcasm. Be careful not to compare him, not to fill your mind with things that would make you desire something else or draw you away from him. Valuing him in thought, words, and actions. Choosing to see him through God's eyes, giving him room and grace to lead, to grow, and even to fail. Proverbs 14.1 says, The wise woman built her house, but with her own hands the foolish one tears her down. Women, we have great power in this to build something beautiful. Let's build our marriages and our homes. And I know, I promise you, that the Lord will show up and we will see something far better than we could ever imagine. Let me go to the last slide. Um, I want you to see something here. You put my Bible on the floor. How dare you? Okay. Uh, I just <laughs> it's in her heart, okay? No. Um, <laughs> so I, I've, I haven't had any questions specifically yet, but I mean, I did this because about 40% of the questions I got um, were about, you know, marriage, sex, relationships, LGBTQ things. Think a lot of them were actually about those things. So I'm going to spend some time talking about that as well. Um, sex and marriage are made to be the image of Jesus in his church. And if you get to the end of Corinthians chapter, or excuse me, Ephesians 5 there, Paul says, he, he, he tells us that, that verse all the way through, um, for a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. And then he says, this mystery is profound, that it refers to Christ in the church. Like, this is the image. Like, so everyone in here, you're an image bearer of God. Every one of us. We image bear Jesus when we love each other within the church, uh, is what Jesus says, and people see that we love one another and they get saved. This is Paul saying, husbands and wives, this is a single guy, by the way. He's a single man, he's never married. And he says, this is a profound mystery. Paul doesn't say that about a whole lot. In fact, he's got words almost for everything. He says, this is a profound mystery, that marriage, that it refers to Christ in the church, that this is the image of God in his church. Now, I want to talk about that for, for a moment. Just think about Christian sexuality. You're given over to the one other person for the rest of your life, just you and them completely given over. In Corinthians, it actually says that wives, your body belongs to your husband. Husband, your body belongs to your wife. So it's like you don't even own yourself anymore. You've been given over physically is what it's talking about. So it's not 50-50. I had a friend tell me, hey, um, marriage is 50-50. It's not. That's transactional. I had a friend say, hey, because the husband's a leader, marriage is 51%, 49%. It's like, yeah, go tell it to your wife. Tell me how that works out for you. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> Right? It, it, it's, it's 100%, 100%. And you can see that in every aspect of marriage. Because Jesus gave everything for you. That's what it represents. So within sexuality, it's everything to the one person. And believe me, God's a jealous God. He gave his son for you. Right? He loves you. And so that's what we see sexually. That's what we see in a wife. She gives herself over. She submits. She gives her body, mind, soul resources, finances, future, hope, dreams, all that over 100% to her husband, right? And then Paul tells us how we're doing that. And then a husband does the same thing. My wife has all that. My hopes, my dreams, my future, my body, even though it's getting older, you know? <laughs> Seriously, all of it, like everything, everything. She's get, she gets it all, 100%. Mind, will, emotions, everything. And that, so it represents Christ 
in his church. Sin, the word for sin is an archery term. It means if I was going to shoot a bow, at, you know, and that glass was the target, and I hit that target, that's the target, right? Sex and marriage is Christ and his church. Boom, that's the target. That's holiness. That's the ethic. That's the gospel. That's what it's meant to portray. Everything that misses that is sin. It's an archery term. It means missing the mark. That's the term for sin in the Bible. Why is homosexuality sin? That's one of the questions I get. Because it misses the mark. Why is pornography sin? It misses the mark. Why is flirting with that guy at work sin? Because it misses the mark. Everything that misses the mark of the gospel, which is what represents that piece of marriage, is sin, period. That's how it works. Because God designed it that way. You think God is jealous over the image of his son and his son's bride? Absolutely. He wants that profaned in no way. Profane means to make common. So it's no longer holy. So everything that misses that mark is sin. So to answer the question, why is homosexuality sin? That's why. Um, can a homosexual be saved? Oh, I thought a question came in. No. So one of the other questions I got, can a homosexual be saved? Here's how I would answer that. Can a pornographer be saved? Do you know why we have an LGBTQ like culture and all that stuff? Because before our current culture, we had a pornography culture. One leads to the other. That's how it got there. 50% of evangelicals that, that call themselves evangelicals view pornography. 30% of those who go to church all the time. Like that would, we would say, you know, they're your, your proper fundamentals or whatever. 30%. And so can a homosexual be saved? Let me ask you the question. Can a pornography be saved? Here's where, this is the one place that I, I was praying about if I should get graphic or not, and, I, and I, I'm going to just a little bit. So... Earmuffs if you're too young. Pornography, I remember I read something about 10 years ago, um, and it was like a survey done on Pornhub, which is the largest porn site in America. And it was something like 30%, I forget the exact number, 30% of the women on there were sex trafficked minors. And guys will say, oh, it's not like I'm raping anybody. I don't know, the statistics don't seem to say that. And then what's on the screen is a man typically a man watching it. Yay. This is all the same thing. Right? I mean, we, most of the men, if we're honest, probably have viewed that, and then we ask the question about homosexuality, and it's like, you've done the same thing. Can a homosexual be saved? Yes. Absolutely. The blood of Jesus covers that fully, just like it covers pornographers, just like it covers people having sex before marriage, just like it covers you got divorced for all the wrong reasons. Like we make this like the golden calf and it's important and it displays the gospel. But man, you can be forgiven. <laughs> God can renew your life from all that stuff. The power of the Holy Spirit can bring you through all of those things as you submit your life to Christ. So yes, a homosexual can be saved. That's my answer. Um, we think because culture tells us that that's not a big deal like, or that doesn't happen very often. I want you to write this down. Go to changedmovement.com. Changedmovement.com. Put it in your Google. You're going to hear thousands of stories, thousands of people from the LGBTQ plus movement that are unsavable, that are radically changed and give their life fully over to God. It's amazing. It's like some of the coolest stuff there is out there. There is a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit in that community right now. It's beautiful. Because the gospel is this, that Christ died to save sinners. Right? So we've we got to be sinners. Okay, uh, next question. Um, a friend of mine, you know, someone I know, whatever, they're living as a homosexual, can they be saved? Um, I want you to take you to a Bible verse. This is a little bit bigger of a conversation, but let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Now the works of the flesh, this is verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity. So sexual immorality, they're saying, you know, that might say fornication, might say homosexuality, something like that in your version. Verse 19, impurity. Ooh, like most of us see the sexual immorality, we're like, oh, I'm good there. What about impurity? How are you doing so far? Sensuality. Idolatry. How are you doing so far? Sorcery. How are you doing so far? Enmity. How are you doing so far? 
I mean, you're good probably on the sexual morality thing, but what about the idolatry, sorcery, enmity? Strife. Ooh. Anybody had any strife this week? I sure did. Jealousy. Puts in the same category here of the sexual morality. Jealousy, same exact category right there. Anger, fits of anger. Okay, I'm not doing that so much anymore. Okay, I'm good there. Rivalry. Yep. Dissension. What about this one? Division. Envy. Drunkenness. Orgies. And things of the like. By the time you get through that list, it's like everybody's pretty guilty. And it says, those who do see such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That word do in the Greek means make a lifestyle out of. Okay? And it's basically saying this. That people will cue in on the homosexuality or sexual immorality part and say, that's the one. What this verse is saying is if I have devoted my life to sin, sin, and this is who I am. This is what I, in the Greek, it, it says, maybe say do in your Bible, some say a way of life or something like that. It really, in the Greek, it's like a way of life. I've become this. If I am sin, am I a Christian? No. So, probably not would be my answer to the question. Probably not a believer. However, I want to tell you that I, I met a man and I evangelized this guy and he became a Christian and he was um, a homosexual and stuff. And he actually, I just shared my testimony and said we're all sinners. And he's like, oh man, I didn't know I could struggle with this and be a Christian. It's like, absolutely. And he was actually in Bible college when he became, decided not to follow God. Anyway, he gets saved. He ends up at a United Methodist church. And not all Methodists are like this. I don't want you to go out there and just hate on Methodists all day. But this particular United Methodist church told him that that was a lifestyle that wasn't sin. It was okay as long as he was in monogamy. Remember, that's not the design. So anything that misses the mark of that design is sin, so it's sin. And so now he's living in that life. So I, I don't know. Someone like that, I have some questions because, like, Maybe the greater sin is the one who's leading them astray into that. Maybe they're really struggling internally with that. Uh, I'll give you one more kind of example, and then we'll end because I'm 15 minutes over. But I'll give you one more example of, you know, people, can people like live a trans life or whatever and, and be saved? Let me talk about that for a minute too. Um, so it misses the mark. God made them male and female, right? We know that everything that misses the mark is sin, so it's sin. Um, but I'll give you three trans people that I, that I know and I've been in a relationship with. Um, one, um, it's totally sin. It's a, it's a lifestyle thing. It's just, it is who they are. They don't care what you say. And they're trying to make it Christian even, which is, that's the new religion, right? Love is love. Um, so I would say yeah, that's, that's person not a Christian. Um, two, uh, I, we knew these two ladies previously, and they were wildly abused, like crazy abused by men. This is a common thing among like lesbians and stuff. They get so abused by men. Stuff you, I won't even talk about. And I've talked about some, serious, you know, some stuff today. And they get so abused, and then they decide to marry one another or whatever. Some pastor tells them it's okay. In this particular case, they were divorced, and one became like fully trans, and the other one, I think, uh, she moved away but started to surrender her life to the Lord, and the Holy Spirit began to work. Um, so I would say one, probably one, the other. I don't know. I mean, we're not actually supposed to really judge these things, but I kind of want to give you guys some, some answers. Um, and then finally... I want to share with you, this is some of the cases. Uh, th these things are sensationalized by the media, um, but I want you to know 30 to 40% of young people are going to go through this as a sexual thing, statistically, 30, 40%. So we've got to learn how to give people our ethics, and we've got to learn how to talk to them about this. It's an important thing. Um, anyway, and, and we need to educate ourselves. And so the last one, is there was a trans um, lady. It was a lady trying to be a guy, and she was at the church. She'd always come in and just be crying and weep in and listen to the gospel. It's beautiful, man. And we are actually set up really well for that. I could get in trouble for this, but we have a bathroom upstairs, and anybody can use it, right? So we could have all kinds of trans people. We wouldn't have the bathroom problem. We just have to use, wait in line on that one. Um, anyway, so she would come to church all the time. It was really, it was really awesome. Um, and her parents called one time, and they said, hey, um, so-and-so is really struggling. And I talked to her mom for a while. She's full-blown schizophrenic. Full blown, and one of the ways her schizophrenia like manifest is in this gender dysphoria thing, and so it's a legit thing. She can't even make decisions for herself. She goes to the doctors over the last five years, and this is really a new thing over the last five to ten years. And the doctors say, well, instead of telling her reality, we're going to lead her into transitioning because that's the correct treatment. That's what the doctors are saying. I don't believe that that's correct, but that's what doctors are saying. 
So is she saved? And I like to think so. She can't even make decisions for herself. She's in there crying, just trying to figure all this out. She's mentally handicapped and completely schizophrenic. And her doctors are leading her into this. I just, man, I just, that's a depth of sorrow. I just don't understand. And I think that the gospel is big, you know? And all those are very three different cases, right? And so as a pastor, I I deal with this quite a bit now these days. Uh, And so I'm always asking the question, but here's the thing. I deal with it because you guys are dealing with it. 30 to 40% of young people are going to be dealing with it because this is now an expression of sexual freedom. Uh, and so it's, it's important that we learn how to talk about it, that we have grace for it. And then here's what I wanted to end with today. Um, I was sexually deviant and all that other stuff. Okay, I'm not going to get into all the details of that. But um, I want to tell you, most of the people that are doing those sort of things, they're looking for love. They're looking for belonging. They're, I mean, there's people out there that are just they're sexually deviant they're just they're just rebellion rebellious to sin. But most that I, most people that I meet, they're like looking for love. They're looking for belonging. They're looking for hope. They're looking for someone to understand them. They're looking for Jesus, right? They need Jesus because Jesus is the answer to all those things. And for me, Jesus met me in the red light district in Nuremberg, Germany. That's what I want to tell you. Jesus meets people in that. He's using you to meet people in that, to give them not your morality. They know your morality. To give them the supreme ethic of Jesus, how he died for them on the cross, how he loves them, how he's calling out to them, how they can have peace and they can have hope and they can have pure intimacy like they've never known or felt before through Jesus himself. And Jesus will take care of all the other stuff. The Holy Spirit will take care of that. Don't lie to people. Don't deceive them. Don't tell them, oh no, like we're great with that and stuff. But man, share them with them your ethics. Like why do we have these sexual ethics? Let me tell you about Jesus. Because it all displays how he gave himself over for you. Christian love, Christian sexuality, Christian marriage is how Jesus gave himself up for you. Share the gospel with them when you get the opportunity. Be wise about that. And if that's you and you're struggling with that and you came, man, everything you're looking for, it's in Jesus. It's not in a person. It's in Jesus. And after you have all that with him, then you can experience some of that in in, in other people and in your marriage. But it's all Jesus. And so I would um, tell you, get alone with the Bible. That's you. And read John chapter 3. And do what it says. Get alone with the Bible. And go to Romans 10. And read that. And do what it says. Let's pray.